introduced the basic ideas about the voice over internet protocol and uh, the fundamental aspect that we had seen is uh, unlike PSTN, the uh, public switch telephone network, which is essentially a uh, circuit switching system which requires a connection to be established beforehand and hence it is uh, costlier because you need uh, the entire connections to be reserved for the call duration and vis a vis that uh, the voice over internet protocol became uh, popular because unlike the circuit switching here you are using a packet switched scheme in which case you are sending the uh, digitized voice data in the form of packets over the network. So, it does not require the exact connection and the packets can be delivered according to the packet switching protocols and uh, there we found that because it is a real time requirement, we have to use the real time protocol okay, supported with the UDP. Okay. We cannot use the TCP IP because in this case, this being a real time, there cannot be any um, uh, retransmission request or the acknowledgements these things we cannot do under the real time anyway. Now, one of the points uh, which we touched upon was the aspect of the end to end delay and the end to end delay is a very important parameter whenever we are uh, uh, communicating between two terminal equipments. Okay. One terminal equipment uh, at one place and the other uh, end we are having that and uh, there may be a very large uh, geographical distance of separation between uh, them. I mean, it, 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 it could be within a campus, it could be within a city, it could be between the city in a nation, it could be even um, uh, I mean from one country to another, it could be even one continent to another. So, uh, the amount of delays would depend upon several factors. but. Uh, and we have seen that even in the circuit switched uh, telephones also in PSTN also we experience a significant amount of delay, especially whenever we are looking at the very long distance communication, whenever we are talking across the uh, continents, okay, there we can uh, feel the amount of delay which uh, one gets okay, in order to get the response and sometimes that really um, uh, spoils the real time conversational effect. Now, it is there in the circuit switching and in the case of the packet switch networks, it is even larger. Okay. In the case of circuit switched, what we do is that when a large number of users are involved and a large number of channels have to communicate, we adopt a thing like the time division multiplexing. So, a PSTN employing TDM that experiences delay, but a PSTN, but uh, if we are instead of PSTN, we are using the uh, VOIP, okay, using the internet as a backbone, there the end to end delays could be even uh, larger. But there is definitely a degree of uh, specification or a degree of tolerance which is mentioned, which is defined in the standard, okay, so that uh, I mean the real time conversational effect is preserved. And as I was telling you, I think you appreciate now that uh, the amount of end to end delay uh, is a factor of several things and one of that is the buffering. And we have seen that if we want to reduce the bandwidth okay, and make a low cost for it. In fact, I mean the reason why we are going in for the VOIP is the low cost because we are not reserving the resources, okay. we are not uh, reserving the um, uh, tr transmission lines during the um, uh, call, but we are just uh, transmitting the packet. So, because of that it gets much uh, cheaper. So, uh, we should uh, that, that is the reason we should also try to use a low bandwidth channel. Let us say something like in G.729 what I was mentioning, there are 8 kilobits per second is quite a standard one, but again as you go in for lower bit rate, 
there the amount of delays uh, or, or the amount of buffering that you require, okay, that is also uh, considerably larger, because you need to accumulate uh, sufficient number of uh, um, uh, bits before you can transmit it as a packet. So, the packet ac accumulation time that is also very important and that contributes to a large delay, but let us see that what uh, is specified. In fact, what is specified for 90 percent of the um, um, conversational application is that I think I made a mention to you that the end to end delay is something like 150 milliseconds. Okay. It is specified to be 150 milliseconds. Of course, 150 milliseconds of delay that may not be uh, um, uh, possible, I mean it may not be possible to restrict the delay to 150 milliseconds whenever we are talking of uh, the, uh, the, I mean calls from one nation to the other, okay, one continent to the other, things like that. So, there the delays would be higher, but a typical delay component would be something like this. So, we can just make a, a quick look as uh, at uh, what are the different delays that we have and uh, there is some delay budget which is a rough specification. I mean do not think that it is a hard and fast mandatory that this has to be fulfilled. So, on net budget if we say that how much of delay budget will be there, okay, we are expressing the times in milliseconds and the delay source. So, we are considering different sources of delay when we are using a standard like say G.729. So, G.729 and basically we are referring to 8 kbps codec, 8, 8 kilobits per second. So, 8 kilobits per second you can take to be the bit rate okay, and just see the different delay components. The first one is the device sample capture. That means to say that whenever you are capturing how much of delay you encounter from the device itself, okay, device sampling capture. So, there it is 0 0.1 milliseconds. Okay. The encoding delay, this is of course, uh, a bit involved thing, okay, forms nearly 10 percent of the total delays is contributed by the encoding delay. So, which basically means the algorithmic delay and the processing delay okay, that uh, you encounter and that is typically a 17.5 milliseconds. Okay. And what is uh, essential in the case of the VOIP is that because here the packetization uh, at the source and depacketization at the destination, these two processes are mandatory. So, that is why you are doing the packetization and depacketization delay, depacketization delays okay. and this is also a very significant 20 milliseconds. So, this is something which will be avoidable in the case of the PSTN because they are you are not using any form of a packetization. Okay. Then uh, move to output queue or queuing delays, okay. the queuing delays up to output. Okay. This is not much, queuing delays is typically 0 0.5 uh, milliseconds. Okay. Then uh, the access or uplink transmission delay, so access link access link transmission delay this could be maximum up to 10 milliseconds okay and what is unpredictable is the backbone network transmission delay so this is the backbone network transmission delay so although we are saying a typical delay of 150 milliseconds when we add up all these things. So, backbone network uh, transmission delay that, uh, that being unpredictable, we cannot really comment on that. So, let us say that we just uh, put something, let us say that we put a number x, okay. we, we keep it undefined, let us say that it is x milliseconds is the backbone network delay okay. and then the 
so this is access transmission delay for the uplink and this is again the access link transmission delay access link transmission delay for down So, this is for down and down also would be of the same order, up is 10 milliseconds, down is also 10 milliseconds. Okay. Input Q to the application, this is not much, okay. in fact, it is 0.5 milliseconds only. Another very prominent area of prominent source of delay is the jitter buffer, because as I was mentioning that delay jitters is very important here, because I mean whenever especially whenever you are you using a multi party conferencing okay, there uh, from uh, the end to end delays that can vary from one terminal to the other and that gives rise to something like delay jitters. And the delay jitter in order to compensate for delay jitter what you have to do is to use a delay buffer. Uh, used to use jitter buffer and jitter buffer could give you 60 milliseconds. Again, this is a very typical figure. Okay. This would depend upon the bit rate. So, maybe that at 8 kilobits per second, we have specified the 60 milliseconds to be the delay, but this may change depending upon your bit rate of application. This could be higher, this could be lower and the decoder processing delay, this also you have to consider. But decoder processing delay is not significant, because it is the encoder which is always the most involved thing. Okay. So, this is decoder delay is 2 milliseconds and the device play out delay, I mean at the output, okay. the device play out delay, this is of the order of 0 0.5 milliseconds. So, these are the different components and now when we add them together, okay, in fact, uh, I mean after addition we will be finding that with this, I mean considering this jitter buffer to be 60 milliseconds and uh, all the other parameters taking their typical value, it comes out as 121.1 plus x. Okay. Now, this x is the backbone network delay. So, obviously, if we specify that the total delay cannot exceed 150 milliseconds. Okay, as is the case with the, uh, the I mean, uh, typical um, uh, applications, okay. barring the specific cases like the very long distance calls and uh, whenever it is across the continents, they are uh, obviously the network, uh, um, uh, the backbone network delay, you cannot keep it restricted to something like 30 milliseconds of figures, because here we require close to 30 milliseconds, 28.9 to be very precise if you want to maintain it at 150 milliseconds. But that will not be possible, that will be possible for, I mean within country network also that would be possible for national networks I mean to say, but for international networks you have to tolerate okay, delays which are longer than that. Okay. Now these are, uh, so this is one very important aspect in fact when we uh, tell about the advantages of the voice over internet protocol vis a vis the uh, uh, PSTN. We also have to remember that delay is something which goes in our disadvantage. Okay. This delay is uh, significant, especially things like uh, this um, uh, packetization, depacketization delay, then this jitter buffer delay. These are some of the delays which are very typical to VOIP only, you will not find them in any circuit switched network. Okay. But still VOIP is popular, again because of the, uh, 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 I mean cheap uh, mode of transmission, you do not require the resource reservation entirely. Now uh, VOIP has gone through several stages of development, in fact if I, I mean before I go Further, okay, I um, uh, should have given you some introductory reference. Okay. In fact, one of the uh, papers that uh, you can refer to is uh, by B. Good, okay. Good. Uh, uh, I mean, the, the name of the paper is Voice over Internet Protocol. 
voice over internet protocol and this is a kind of a tutorial paper you can say this appeared in the proceedings of IEEE. In fact, proceedings of IEEE you will be finding that mostly on the very contemporary topics okay, articles which are of tutorial nature okay, where lot of basic introductory things are explained. Okay. This uh, you, you should consult proceedings of IEEE volume 90 number 9 September 2002. So, please consult this. So, many of, of the aspects that we had discussed okay, you can find over there. Okay. Uh, but uh, today our uh, topic will be I mean going into little more involved aspect of the voice over internet protocol and we will be talking about the voice over internet protocol signaling. Okay. And in signaling the protocol or the standard that is widely accepted or rather the protocol which has been specified by the International Telecommunication Union ITU is the H.323 protocol. Okay. So, we will talk about this in the present lecture okay. and uh, basically what we mean by signaling. Signaling is mind you not a concept that uh, is uh, very typical of the voice over internet protocol. In fact, the signaling is there even for the ordinary PSTN networking also has to go through certain kind of signaling. And what for signaling is used to tell you very broadly, okay, what you want to do is basically some kind of protocol for a call setup okay, and uh, likewise for the call tear down. Okay, when you want to build a call, when you want to end a call, okay, everything should be followed in a protocol. In fact, I mean there is nothing uh, that is unusual about it. Okay, even if it is not a telephone, I mean whenever you are uh, talking to somebody okay, in a bit of formal way, I mean, I mean not uh, your friend whom you are meeting on the corridor or in the dining room. So, there you can directly, I mean without following any protocol also you can make a, uh, you can start a conversation. Okay. But, uh, even then also, I mean when you want to call a friend at least you have to shout with his name and then he has to look at you, he has to uh, respond, he should be prepared to listen to you and then you begin your communication something like that. But again the degree of protocol that would vary that uh, to whom you are trying to communicate. Okay. When you are trying to communicate with a teacher naturally your protocol becomes somewhat different. Okay. If you have to, uh, now okay, I mean to the teacher also you can raise your hand, you can ask something and then uh, I mean when the teacher is ready to uh, answer to your question, okay, he finishes some uh, specific point and then he comes back to you that uh, okay, I mean what is going to be your question, okay, some, some kind of a permission you get and then you ask the question. Uh, Again, you see that even for the uh, uh, a, a formal way of uh, ending a conversation that also requires a protocol because you do not just uh, say something and go out. I mean you may do it in a very informal way, but uh, when you want to do it in a bit of formal way, you always say that okay, see you then or bye. Okay. These are some of the common protocols that you follow. The same thing is there even for the uh, call establishment, call setup and call uh, tear down. Okay. I am I'm, I'm not saying that not only it is there in our conversational process, but even before the conversation actually begins. That means to say that we send the uh, voice packets okay, over the network. Okay. Just one terminal has to communicate with another terminal okay, in that formal manner before the actual transmission of packet can begin through the RTP. Okay. So, RTP we know, we understand that when we are transmitting uh, the voice packets, okay, 
that time it is a real train time transmission of voice packets. So, we have to transmit ultimately through the RTP, but the establishment of the call, I mean all the things that go on before a call is actually started, okay, that requires lot of signaling process and it is there in the um, um, process of the uh, uh, packet, uh, uh, I, I mean in the PSTN, I mean public switch telephone network and it is very much expected that the same um, that a very si similar signaling should also be followed as in the VOIP. Actually this aspect was not really addressed at the very beginning, but soon when the need was felt that in order to have an interoperability of the products, because uh, what happened if we look at the developmental process of VOIP, we will be finding that the initial development, okay, I mean uh, forget about the pre-commercial aspects that when the VOIP was restricted mostly to the university research and all, but when the application actually started coming in with the uh, PCs, uh, okay. There the VOIPs were initially implemented as a proprietary protocol which was adopted by the PC vendors, okay. So naturally, if it is a proprietary protocol of the PC vendors, there you are restricted to using the same kind of PC for the communication and uh, the interoperability is lost. So, so realizing that in order to ensure the interoperability, this standard was actually enforced okay, for the communication between the terminal equipments. Okay. And in fact, the H.323 protocol, it is not that something which was entirely developed from the scratch. Okay. If you look at the architecture of H.323, you will be finding that it is actually an umbrella of different protocols which are already existing. Right. So, as I was telling you about the stages of development, okay, the different stages of development that the VOIP has gone through, roughly we can, I mean uh, in the chronological way we can uh, broadly divide into three stages. One is what is called as the pre-commercial stage, okay. the very early development started taking place way back in 1980 and till 1995. So, this was the time when you can say that it was more in the concept preparation stage and uh, the university research domain mostly. Okay. Um, uh, but okay, some standardization efforts were also done, okay, realizing uh, the future or would be needs of voice over internet protocol. Because you see, when uh, the need was felt, again we are talking of a time, I mean consider the later aspect of this period 80 to 95, uh, by uh, 90, by 1890 the uh, JPEG standard uh, was formulated within a uh, couple of years, the MPEG standard was also uh, formulated, the MPEG 1 came into being. So, when this standard started coming, and at the same time the VOIP development uh, was conceived, the, I mean people could dream that at least a uh, few years down the line the packet switching uh, is going to dominate the internet community in such a big manner that in future days the uh, whether to talk of voice or whether to talk of video, images, everything would be through the internet. And realizing that it was felt that okay, the real time protocol has to be there. Okay. You cannot say that uh, everything could be just on an acknowledgement and uh, uh, retransmission uh, for uh, uh, lost packets. Okay. You cannot have that all the time. So, uh, realizing the future potential during this stage only, the Internet Engineering Task Force, okay, the Internet Engineering Task Force, you must have heard about this body IETF. Okay. IETF formulated different uh, standards and one of that is for the, so they had a subgroup, IETF had a subgroup which is called as the audio video transport, okay. audio video transport. 
okay, or in short form it is called as the AVT. So, it is the AVT subgroup of the internet engineering task force. So, this is internet engineering task force. Okay. Now, the AVT team they realize the real time uh, transmission requirements of that and it is during this time that they developed the RTP <coughs> protocol, which you know is really a great thing to do, because unless RTP protocol had been there, it would not have been possible okay, to ever realize the dream of the, uh, uh, I mean voice over internet. Okay. But at the same time, when uh, the university research was going on, people also felt the requirements of the multi-party conferencing. Okay. And in fact, by then, I mean when we are talking of 80 to 95, uh, in very small scales, okay, people also started doing the multi-party conferencing or the video conferencing, multimedia conferencing. Uh, uh, mostly the video conferencing, but video conferencing what was done during that time was not through the packet switched network, but it was through the circuit switched. In fact, uh, for video conferencing or multimedia conferencing using the circuit switching, okay, the standards were already established. Okay. There were standards like the H.320 okay, and later on the H.324, maybe H.324 is not really contemporary to this, few years down the line H.324 was developed, but okay, let us talk that even H.320 was there. And another uh, aspect which was developed for the purpose of the multimedia conferencing is what is called as the session initiation protocol, session initiation protocol. Okay. This was really a, uh, a great thing to be developed, the SIP, okay, because SIP forms the core of the, uh, forms the core protocol for the um, uh, uh, multimedia conferencing or the video conferencing. So, naturally the, all the preparations were done during this 80 to 95 stage. We had the SIP, we had the RTP. We had the multimedia conferencing standards like the H.320 at least. And then came the second stage of development and the second stage of development actually was uh, PC centric. Okay. So, this was PC centric and as I was telling you that it is during this time, that means to say that we are talking of the time 1995 to 1998, when the PC vendors, they wanted to make this VOIP popular by adopting proprietary products, okay. but proprietary protocols definitely could not be the answer, because then the interoperability is lost and that is where the, that is when the ITU, the International Telecommunication Union had to intervene and they had to conceive of the signaling protocol in the form of the H.323, which we are going to discuss in details now. Okay. And uh, then uh, the third stage okay, or rather to say you can still say that that is under the development and a lot of efforts have been already uh, carried out on that, that is the carrier grade VOIP. Okay. Just like the way uh, see for the PSTN, you have the carrier grade PSTN in the sense that uh, where you can uh, have, I mean you can uh, uh, have the bandwidth partitioning, bandwidth allocations to the different uh, sub subscribers and uh, I mean the way uh, you are finding today the mobile uh, phones are uh, working. So, catering to the large number of users, which of course the H.323 standard per se could not uh, do it. So, naturally here we are looking beyond something like, uh, uh, I mean something beyond H.323. Okay. So, we will be talking about the uh, carrier grade uh, VOIP little later, okay. maybe I mean in, uh, uh, I mean in, in, in a smaller scale we would restrict, because 
we want to talk more about the signaling aspect and there especially this H.323 standard. Okay. Now, before we go into the H.323 standard, okay, let us see that uh, what is the kind of uh, the network environment that we are talking of. Okay. Primarily, in order to uh, have the uh, H.323 uh, would operate on different uh, zones of uh, the uh, lands. Okay. So, let us say that there could be one local area network, there could be another local area network and they might be, so this is one LAN and this is another LAN and these two LAN may be connected by a wide area network. Let us say that here we have a WAN okay, to connect these two LANs. Okay. And actually speaking, there will be such multiple WANs, multiple LANs okay, fully interconnected to each other. But when such kind of uh, network uh, structure we are talking of, okay, then there are certain essential things that every network, we, we should call this as a zone. So, say we typically consider a zone 1 of LAN and another zone 2 of LAN. Okay. Now, zone 1 of LAN will be having some terminal equipments. Okay. These terminal equipments are nothing but the end points, means so where the user is located and uh, the uh, audio or video transmission has to take place. <coughs> and likewise, in zone 2 also we consider some terminal equipment, there may be large number of terminal equipment. So, now, let us say that typically we want to establish a connection or rather one, we want to transmit voice from this T to this T or back, I mean in a conversational mode we want that. Now, other than these two, okay, we also need several other uh, components. Okay. One of that is that since we are uh, communicating between two different LANs and we are uh, uh, migrating from one network to the other, okay, definitely what is essential for us is to use a gateway. So, this zone will have a gateway, this zone will also have a gateway. You can say something like this that uh, supposing there are two buildings, okay, in within one building uh, there are many terminals which are available in building two also there are terminals, but between uh, or, or I mean let us let us not talk about terminal, let us let us talk um, in the usual way that okay, I mean we have uh, I mean one person in building 1 wants to communicate to uh, somebody in building number 2. Okay. So, then what he, uh, that person has to do is to go out, I mean if he wants to deliver a message, okay. let us say physically when he wants to go and deliver a message, okay. say telephones are not available okay, and he wants to just go and deliver a message. He, he has to come out of the main entry door, so that main entry door is nothing but the gateway. Okay. So, there will be gateways. So, even if the lands are different, the gateways have to take care, gateways uh, have the standard. So, that I mean whatever the terminal equipment wants to communicate to another, okay, the language of the, the um, 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 way in which it should be done through the van and maintaining the standard, that will be maintained by the gateway. And then uh, we also have a, uh, I mean for the multi conferencing facility, multi party conferencing facility, we should have what is called as the uh, multiple control unit, multi party control unit or we can say in short form as the MCU. Okay. Even if, if MCUs are not there, still two way conversation will be possible, but when you want three or more than three parties uh, um, doing a conversation, there you would be requiring an MCU. Now, gate is needed, okay, terminal is needed, you, you want multi party, then MCU is also needed, but just see that even in buildings also, when you just have a gate, when you have an unmanned gate, okay, you land up in lot of problems, okay. you require a security at the gate. 
okay, what for? Because you do not want that everything in the building okay, should be accessed by anybody. Okay. There should be something like an authorization okay. and uh, I mean we talk about uh, security in that respect, but even that security I mean what we want is uh, not somebody who would just uh, get up and say salam and then allow you to enter. I mean it should be something like an intelligent security in the sense that when you want to communicate from one terminal to another, okay, you have to make a request okay, to that gatekeeper that yes, I mean you would like to uh, uh, I mean make a communication, okay. that gatekeeper will give you the call admission, okay. that gatekeeper will allocate the bandwidth for you. Okay. So, in other words, it is the gatekeeper who, will, who should have the full control. Okay. In fact, this gatekeeper concept was not there initially, okay. when as long as the gateway is there to interconnect the zones and as long as the terminal equipments are there, it should have been enough. But uh, whenever we are talking of the commercial usage of VOIP, okay, there the gatekeeper should play a major role that even things like the access control, billing, all these things have to be done okay, by using a gatekeeper. So, we are keeping the gatekeeper or in short form we are saying as GK okay, also in the network. So, these are the essential components. Now, there could be multiple number of TEs, there could be even multiple number of gateways because I mean you may use separate gateways for different WAMs and not only that, uh, one point which you have to remember that uh, for the normal uh, internet gateways that one uses for the data transmission, they are the LAN to LAN connection or LAN to WAN connection, these are the only important aspects, but here this gateway has to also consider the interworking with the PSTN because the very fact that we are using the VOIP okay, does necessarily mean that not only we should be able to uh, communicate with somebody who is connected in the LAN, okay, but also with somebody who is in the PSTN okay, and vice versa. Somebody in the PSTN also should be able to communicate with somebody who is having an internet telephone with him. Okay. So, uh, because of this aspect, this, this gateway what we had seen the gateway in the, uh, uh, I mean for the just plain and simple data communication network, here the gateway should be little more involved to take care of the PSTN to uh, the uh, internet interface, okay, that also should be available. So, when such PSTN to internet conversion is there, naturally there is, there has to be a signaling conversion, there has to be a message conversion everything. Okay. So, now this is uh, more or less the uh, architecture. So, this is the architecture of an H.323 network, okay. but what is the essential ingredients of H.323? Let us consider uh, these aspects. Okay. As I was telling you that H.323 is essentially an umbrella of some protocols. In fact, it is an umbrella of four protocols and what are these four protocols? One is uh, what is called as the registration, admission and status. You can say gate pass okay that the gatekeeper has to check your gate pass okay so that's by the registration admission and status or called as the ras in fact ras is an accepted protocol okay and when ras is to be used mandatorily you have to use a gk the gatekeeper okay the earlier versions uh, of voice over internet protocol did not use a gatekeeper. So, there uh, RAS was not an essential component, but when H.323 came in okay, that time 
the RAS was also considered to be one of the basic ingredients. Okay. And then of course, registration admission is only for taking care of the call admission and bandwidth allocation uh, etcetera, okay, all very preliminary things. But then also the actual signaling protocol like you are wanting to set up, then uh, the acknowledgement, I mean that you are granted the uh, resource to use it. Okay. These signaling protocols are already existing, okay, even prior to H.323, these signaling protocols were existing for the PSTN and in fact there the standard that was used is Q.931. So, Q.931 basically contained the signaling protocol okay, over the PSTN and ISDN, okay. but uh, in this case the Q.931 when we want to apply it over VOIP, okay, naturally it has to consider that what are the signaling that would be necessary for the uh, VOIP, because specifically in this case we are having uh, a gatekeeper sitting in between. So, naturally the uh, signaling protocol will go through some differences, because we are having uh, another uh, party that is uh, coming, uh, I mean sitting in between. So, Q.931 as we perceived, uh, as we have in the PSTN or ISDN needs extension and that is addressed in the Q.931 what is adopted in H.323. So, definitely it is something enhanced than the Q.931 of PSTN ISDN. Okay. Then there is a requirement for the connection control and for connection control the protocol that is existing for the ITU is the H.245. So, this is the connection control protocol okay. and by connection control we mean to say that basically it does what is called as the capability negotiations between the endpoints. You see the terminal endpoints what we are talking of in the H.323 architectures, okay, they could be having differing capabilities okay, because there are a number of standards that is there for the audio codec. So, you, so which standard of audio coding are you using okay, and then uh, which uh, standard of video coding are you using, all these different standards are existing and the capability again, what is the capability of the terminal, it has to be negotiated based on that. So, uh, one terminal equipment wanting to communicate with another ter terminal equipment has to go through a process of inquiring about the capability and then allocating the resources accordingly. So, this is controlled by the H.245 and of course, one aspect which has to be essential is a real time transport protocol. So, the RTP which is already an essential ingredient for transmission of the actual packet that is also coming under the H.323 umbrella. So, H.323 uses the existing protocol and adds to make it to make the VOIP uh, more towards a commercial application and towards the sophistication. These are the four that are essential ingredients which are attached plus there are some enhancement capabilities which I will be talking of in future. Now, this uh, protocol relationships, okay, you can have a total look at what are the, pro, uh, that how these protocols should be related to each other. Okay. So, let us get a pictorial view of that, say that in the matter of the control Okay, you have the some control protocol, you have got some data protocol, okay. you have protocols for the audio and video that means to say the audio and video coding okay. and then you have the uh, AV control, the audio video control and especially this has to be a real time control and the type of controls which we were talking of in terms of the gatekeeper. 
okay, the gatekeeper controls. So, th and this control means that this uh, here we are referring to as the signaling control, the signaling plus the uh, um, uh, connection, okay, signal plus connection control. So, controls at different levels, control at the signal and connection we will be talking of over here and here it will be audio video control and here it will be gatekeeper control. So, for control over the signal, what is the standard that we are using? I have mentioned it just now that the signaling controls are specified under Q dot 931 okay. and the connection controls are given by H dot 245. For data, there is an already existing protocol. Okay. In fact, data does not come directly under the H.323, but in a typical transmission scenario, okay, you have to use the data and it is T.120. For audio video, naturally you require the codecs okay, and these are the different codecs that you are using for the audio. For audio, the codec standards followed by the ITU is G.7 series. Okay. 7xx. So, like there we have the G.729 and all, all such different versions and also we talked about the H.26x standards like the H.261, 263, 264. These are for the video, but of course, these are the coding standards. Okay. This is about the encoding, but then whatever bit stream you are generating that has to be put through the real time transport protocol. So, naturally, RTP should come immediately after this G.7XX or H.26XX. Okay. And for the audio visual control, there has to be a real time control protocol and that is called as the RTCP. It is the real time control protocol. And for the gatekeeper, we already mentioned that it has to be the registration, admission and status protocol or the RAS protocol. So, these are the basic things okay, that we will be requiring at the higher level and at the transport layer, okay, we require the use of the TCP or the UDP. Now, whichever are not real time, you see the signaling, signaling has to be a very robust one, signaling control or the connection control for the negotiations of uh, the, I mean capability negotiations or the integrity of the data. So, everywhere the integrity is important and until and unless you begin the actual voice communication or the actual video communication, your real time aspects are not yet coming. Okay. So, there you can afford for these protocols, okay, you can afford to uh, put them into the uh, network using the TCP, okay, whereas the other parts like this uh, 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 actual audio video packets which has to be transmitted through the RTP okay, and this RTCP or even this RAS, okay, this have to be done okay, through the universal datagram protocol or UDP. Okay. So, this should be UDP RTP whereas and, and then finally, the last uh, layer has to be the IP layer okay, below this. So, either it is TCP IP okay, taking care of these protocols or you should be or it should be UDP IP taking care of the RTP and above RTP the codecs. So, this is the total pictorial scenario. So, this you can say that the protocol relationships in H.323. Now, uh, I think it is very essential at this stage to know about that how the actual uh, that what are the different stages that one goes through okay, in a process of call. Okay. So, in fact, for an age dot 3 to 3 call okay, to materialize an end, okay, successfully end. Okay. So, there uh, 
it has to go through seven phases. So, H dot 3 to 3 call goes through seven phases and what are the seven phases? Okay. The very first phase is what is referred to as the, so we can say the phase and then we can talk about the concerning protocol for that. So, the first phase is the call admission that means to say that asking for permission through the gatekeeper to make or receive a call. Even for receive a call also you have to seek the gatekeeper's permission and at the end of this phase the end point or the terminal equipment that receives the Q.931 uh, transport address. Okay. Now, which is the protocol that should support this call admission? It is the, just now I mentioned, the RAS protocol. So, RAS protocol and that resides in the GK. So, RAS protocol in the GK has to take care of the call admission. Okay. Then comes the question of call setup you are permitted, okay, when you know that you are permitted, the, the GK tells you and gives you the transport address, okay, then you do the call setup. What, what protocol should be used over here? Yes, Q.931 has to be used because Q.931 is the signaling protocol okay, that is used and then once the call setup is initiated, okay, then there should be the capability negotiation and capability negotiation we already said that the protocol for that is H.245 after the call setup it goes to the capability negotiation for which the standard is H.245 okay. and then once the capability negotiation is successful okay, then the actual conversation begins. So, this is the stable part of the call okay, which can continue I mean as long as you want to come uh, talk to your friend. Okay. You can maintain this stable call and during this what should be the protocol? What should be the only protocol that comes in is the RTP. Okay. I mean at the lower layer it is the RTP, upper layer of course the codec is important whether it is G.7 or H.264 whatever. Then once the call is over, you have to go through the reverse process. The call has to close down. Okay. So, you have to say the uh, um, resource reservation that you had done in terms of the codex and all these things that has to close down. So, there is a channel closing and this also goes through the capability negotiation process. So, H.245 for the reversal, the channel closing and then the opposite of the call setup okay, in the telecommunications parlance is called as the tear down, okay. call tear down. So, this is the ending process and ending also has to be associated with the proper signaling sequence which will be given by Q.931. Okay. And then the final saying goodbye, okay. this is by the call disengage process okay. and this call disengage process there, I mean we have to uh, just disengage ourselves after satisfying the GK. I mean we have to inform the GK that yes, the call has ended. So now, now GK has the monitoring, so if GK has to record our call or if the GK has to note down the times for which the um, communication was used. So, for billing purpose the GK can use that. So, the GK's information goes primarily through this RAS. Okay. This is where GK is mandatory and I was telling you that uh, GK is not always mandatory uh, for very simple systems, it is not mandatory and in fact, I mean like it, it may appear to you that as if to say the connections are uh, uh, I, I mean quite time consuming process. Okay. For fast, there is a methodology for fast connect also in which case you can integrate this call setup and uh, this uh, capability negotiation 
okay. And even the same thing for channel closing and call tear down, they can be uh, I mean combined together in what is called as the fast connect protocol. Okay. This is a very anyway, we will talk about uh, some uh, further aspects of H.323 in the coming class. Okay. Till then, thank you. Just uh, be, be here for a few minutes. I mean, let me quickly go through the attendance process, which I have neglected for quite some time. Vamsi Krishna.